Hello everyone, this video will focus on a new quest Caribert that just got released with version 3.5. This means that if you haven't played it yet, this video is a complete spoiler. Since this is a long video, again, I'll just cut the intro short. This is a theory video, I use information available in the game, but my theories and deductions are based on my personal interpretation and research so they're not to be considered the official lore of the game. With that out of the way, let's start with the deep analysis of the quest. At the beginning of the quest, we meet Kaya in Port Ormos and he just tells us that his origins are in Kanria and that he has little to no knowledge about it except for the fact that Kanria is said to have been located deep underground somewhere near Sumeru. He knows this because he read it in a book when he was a kid, which is odd considering we haven't found any books about Kanria anywhere in Teval so far. Anyway, Kanria's location still makes no sense to me because Kanria had a sky. In the quest, Ida tells Caribear that there is no red sky anymore, and when looming got to Kanria during the Cataclysm, we could clearly see both the sky and the moon. Of course, this is Genshin Impact, they can just say that Kanria is in a domain and the problem is solved. Although, it would make sense for the city to have been built in something like a crater, maybe one created by yet another celestial nail, so deep underground could mean in a deep ravine somewhere lower than the rest of Tevat. Also, Kanria being close to Sumeru would explain the Rune Golem and the Valley of Dahri, where Dahri is an archaic name that the Vahumana Darshan uses to talk about Kanria. Then Dainslev appears and starts talking to Kaya. He tells him that he's the descendant of the founder of the Abyss Order, which is something Kaya didn't know but was suspicious about. Let's highlight the fact that Dainslev says descendant, not son of the founder of the Abyss Order. This means that everything I've ever thought about Kaya was completely wrong. He didn't get to modern time Mondstadt through time travel, he was actually born in modern time and brought to Mondstadt by his father. Kaya recognizes that Dainslev is a pure blood Kanrian from his eyes. Now, the difference between Dainslev and Kaya's eyes is the shape of the diamond. Kaya's diamond is completely full, while Dainslev's is empty in the middle. Now, I may be reading too much into it, and I may be completely wrong about this. The problem is that, as we will find out later, the pure blood got the curse of immortality, while the half blood and the foreigners got the curse of wilderness. Now, if the shape of the diamond is an indication of the purity of Karian's blood, why was half then transformed into a shadowy husk? His diamond pupil is empty on the inside, just like Dainslev's. So, yeah, I have no idea there. Then Dainslev talks about the Abyss Order and about the fact that Lumine didn't found it. She is indeed a princess, not a queen, so there is a succession of sword when it comes to the rulers. Which at this point should have been pretty obvious already. Dainslev is in Sumeru because he's investigating the Loom of Fate like he did back in Mondstadt. This Loom of Fate was mentioned by Lumine while they were traveling together in Sumeru, so he decided to take a look at the place he remembered. After Dainslev had this drink, we went to the Avidia forest and he recognized a specific place. We inspect the field and then the house where we find a bed, a motor where medicine was made and a box with a broken mirror. I guess the writer just loved broken objects that turn out to be important at the end of the quest. Later, Paimon asks Aether about his travels with Lumine. They basically look up at the sky, pointing at the planets they wanted to visit, which brought them to witness hope and despair throughout the universe. This is the first time Paimon has ever asked about Lumine and Aether's past with her. I'm gonna butcher your name, but as Heroes9889 noticed, it's also the first time planets have been mentioned, but also the concept of universe. We have always been told about worlds and stars or the sea of stars. After Dainslev wakes us up and allows us to sleep a little longer, the real quest begins. Wrong. We are already in Lumine's memories. The quest began when Dainslev alone, and not Paimon, woke us up. We wake up again and we meet a person who's clearly from Kanria who tells us that he saw our companion go into the forest in the morning. As we played the quest, we probably didn't notice the fact that he said companion and not companions, but we still believed he was talking about both Dainslev and Paimon. Well, I mean, he was talking about Dainslev anyway. The man introduces himself as Ida, saying he was once Karian and that he received the Curse of Immortality, a gift given to the people of Karia by the gods. We learned that Kanria was built by the members of a single bloodline, the pure blood Kanrians, but it was also a safe haven for people who left their nations and forsook their gods. 
This is the reason why some people, the pure blood Karians, were considered greater sinners and got the curse of immortality, while others, the half-bloods and the foreigners that aligned with Karia, got the curse of wilderness, turning into monsters. We learned that the Hillacher on the bed is Caliber, Ida's illegitimate son, half Karian, half Monstarer. Ida doesn't want to talk about Caliber's mother. He just said, she was, we were separated. The fact that Ida hates the Archons doesn't necessarily mean that they were actually the ones who put the curse on the people of Caria. This is most likely just his belief, misconception or something that he was told and I'm sure about this because we later go to the Statue of the Seven where Ida has a little monologue against the God of Wisdom, saying that she's one of the culprits behind the curse but we already know that she didn't even go to Caria during the Cataclysm. Ida tells us that he wants to make a medicine that uses the power of the God of Wisdom that can awake the mind from a state of deep stupor, a forbidden medicine that he read about in the Royal Library of Kanria. The ingredients are a red strange Rukashava mushroom, a Kalpalara lotus and a Sumeru rose. We need to talk about the ingredients because there's one little problem here you may have not thought about. Rukashava mushrooms are, well, were said to be the holy crystallization of Rukadevata's legacy. Kalpalara lotuses were said to be the first thing that Lord Rukadevata ever created. Sumeru roses instead are sensitive to the ley lines. You might be asking why I'm using the original description of the first two flowers. Well, you see, we are now in the past, something like 400 years ago. Rukadevata was already dead, but her consciousness still lingered inside Ermen's soul. Despite the memories of Rukadevata being erased from the people in the present and in the past, the original story still took place during the original timeline, so Kusunali was just 100 years old, she was basically an infant and she was imprisoned in the sanctuary of Surastana, so she wouldn't have been able to help Ida even if she wanted to. Anyway, the ingredients seem to be very focused around Rukadevata and I think this was one of the reasons why we were able to relive this memory. After Ida begged the God of Wisdom before the Statue of the Seven, we go back to Caribear to give him the medicine, but nothing happens. Either suggests that maybe one single pill was not enough, so we have to make another batch. Ida asks us to get some water from the waterfall near the statue at specifically 2 in the afternoon. This is very strange. This specific time appears way too many times to be just a random thing, but we have too little knowledge about it to come up with a theory. I could think that this was the exact time in which the people were cursed, but in the We Will Be Reunited video we see a moon in the sky. It could be that the curse was laid upon the people at 2pm, but Lumine arrived in Caria at night witnessing only the destruction, but I honestly don't know. On our way back, if you forgot about the four leaf sigils like I did, you would have noticed that Hayan and Futu, the two NPCs that are normally in that spot, have been substituted with Hajan and Fateh, probably their ancestors. Anyway, we go back to Ida, who waters the crop and leaves us there while he makes some fertilizer. And another group of enemies appears, attracted by something. At this point I realized that whatever was turning the Rukashava mushrooms red was the reason why the elemental beings were being attracted, but we will talk about this at the end of the video. After making some medicine again, we follow a hillature that was headed for the chasm and we end up in a place with the same architectural style as both Enkanamiya and the upside down city in the chasm. Now what is this place? I think it is the upside down city in the chasm, or at least an earlier version of it that the abyss spawned. There is a fog wall to go inside, so it's not a place that was really there. We probably entered a temporary domain that sent us even further back in time, at least that's my theory. Ida doesn't recognize the place, he's never seen it before. Which is really strange considering how Dainslev recognized the similarities between the upside down city in the chasm and Caria. We see the hillagers repeatedly walking and bowing down so we explore the place and either feels like this is a familiar scene because it's basically what we already witnessed in the upside down city in the chasm. We travel through some kind of teleportation device and either wonders what energy is powering it. Whenever Zack Aguilar gets a voice line, it means it's something important. The teleportation device, I would say it's clearly powered by the Abyss, considering what we see is identical to what we saw during the Perilous Trail quest when Yelan instantly recognized the Abyss. We have to solve a puzzle, also defying gravity since we are teleported on the ceiling and, once again, another voice line by Zack Aguilar. 
Once we get the pieces, we open a trapdoor on the floor, which reminds me of the one in Economia where we fight the Coral Defenders. Once we go down, we meet the new Cryo Herald, the Fortune Lector, Secret Keeper of Fate's End. He tells us that Fate has not granted us the right to enter the place, either says that he doesn't look like he's from the Abyss Order, the Lector, thinking that we were insisting for an audience, grants us the Trial of Destiny. We defeat him and, for some reason, Ida is drooling over the Lector's perfection and power. I'm not gonna talk about the Herald now, I'll just say that this Herald doesn't seem to be from the Abyss Order simply because it hadn't been founded yet. Anyway, we go on and we finally reach the end of the place, where we find this huge purple stone wrapped in chains, hanging in midair, emanating a sinister aura just like the Defile statue in Liyue, and either realizes that the worship inheritors are very similar to the Grand Thief. This is when the voice inside the head speaks. Now, because this needs a dedicated section of the video, we will skip the analysis of the speech for now. The voice says that he's not a god, he's a sinner, and he imbues Ida with his powers. Ida doesn't remember bowing down and anything that happened. He just knows he felt peace and joy. He's also been feeling good ever since we entered this place, just like Dainslev said he felt his curse being alleviated in the upside down city in the chasm. We go back to Caribur, we give him the medicine and surprise, Caribur's mind is back to normal. Caribur doesn't seem to remember anything that's happened to him since he's become a healer. He thinks he went to sleep for a long time and dreamed to be hiding in a little room, afraid to go out. I do have an old theory about the souls of the people of Canria being extracted and put into the cubes we saw in Canria. Dainslev also says that it's strange that Halfdan retained self-awareness without it, although he never specified what it was, so something was extracted from them. The problem is that if Caribert's soul was inside one of those boxes, how did it regain it? Is the power of that stone this strong? Again, the voice has a dedicated section in the video, so we're gonna talk about this later. After Caribert realizes he's now a monster, Ida has him promise never to take his mask off. As Danes left told us in the past, Hillichers wear masks to hide their appearance and prevent themselves from seeing their own reflection by accident, which would cause them great despair. We go outside and suddenly Ida is now the most religious person in the world, which is ironic since the people of Canria didn't want any god to rule over them and Ida in particular despised even the idea of going near the Statue of the Seven. Ida decides to go back to his newly found god, we follow him and the stone has disappeared together with the worshipping hillagers. This contributes to the idea of that place being a temporary domain, a chaotic space where time flows in a different way. We were probably teleporting in a different moment in time the second time we got in. Ida still feels the power of the stone flowing through his mind and body, which means that it was an illusion. And we are hit with the usual Genshin Impact sentence I do believe that someday in the future we shall see it again. We go back to the house, Caribert is not there anymore, and we found the mirror on the floor. Ida is surprised when he sees that the mirror is broken, which to either makes no sense since to him the mirror has been broken all along, just like the jar at the end of the quest in version of Genesis. We find Caribert on the edge of a small cliff, he can stand this change and we see the power of the abyss surging from behind his mask and as he took it completely off, the power just burst out and we faint as per usual. When we wake up, we are back in the house with Ida who tells us he's known all along who we really are. He reveals his true name, Clothar Albrecht. He points out that the power inside Caliber and the power of the sinner were the same, the power of the abyss. Of course, he doesn't tell us what happened to Caliber, but he tells us that he's now able to weave his own destiny anew. Born into abject sorrow, he shall now become the loom of fate. So the whole thing, I think was made so that we wouldn't find out whether Caribur is still alive or if he jumped down. I think it's pretty obvious that he's alive because, well, Kaya. I'm not saying that Caribur is Kaya, of course, but if Kaya is a descendant of Clothar, then Caribur can't be dead. This also means that the curse of wilderness was lifted because it would be really hard for a hillager to have kids with a human. The people of Caria believed that the Traveler would have brought them strength and hope. 
To them, the Traveler was the Abyss, a mystery beyond imagination and comprehension. And the one who controls the Abyss can control everything. They were sure that the Traveler would bring them to that future, but it didn't happen. Finally, we realized that Clother is talking to Lumine and that we were relieving her memory from the past. So, apart from saying that Lumine was supposed to give them a great future, but instead she brought destruction for forbidden knowledge, what's interesting is the who controls the abyss can control everything, which could be a confirmation of a theory of mine, that is that the abyss is what keeps Tevat alive, the power that fuels the entire master domain Tevat. We are woken up by Dainsleth and Paimon. The ley lines nearby had been tampered with by the Abyss Order, so since they carry information and memories, Danes left the deuce that we saw something in our dreams. I also think it's Ruka Devata's doing. She probably heard Ida's request, but being dead, she couldn't do anything but record a memory to be given to the Traveler in the future. Danes left confirms that Clothar Albrecht was the founder of the Abyss Order. He did many great things, but the curse of immortality tormented his body and mind, and after a century, he lost his mind and simply disappeared. We tell Dainsleth what we saw, and he confirmed that this happened centuries ago. That Lumine named the Loom of Fate for the first time back then, but she never told him about Clothar and Caliber, so that may have been the moment in which Lumine changed and eventually decided to join the Abyss Order. We then dig up what was buried underneath the field, and we found the skeleton of a woman together with that of a man holding a seal scarf in his hand, who was buried later. The man is Clothar Albrecht, which obviously should be impossible, like Dainsleth said since he was cursed with immortality. The only feasible explanation is that he managed to lift his own curse in the end and was able to die. Perplexed, Dainsleth decides to split up, also because he might have seen either. Dainsleff has an idea about who this being is, and despite it being a memory from hundreds of years ago, time seems to be no obstacle to him. Now, before talking about who he is, we need to talk about three quick things. First, the reason why elemental beings are attracted by the crop. We learn that in the field, Clothar buried his lover, the woman from Mondstadt, Caribert's mother. The thing is that when we dug up the bodies, they were the skeletons of a man and of a woman. If anyone who wasn't a pure blood Carrion turned into a monster, how comes that her remains are those of a human being? My theory is that she either died before she was cursed, or that she died before the curse turned her into a monster. I also don't think she simply died, but someone put an end to her, since Ida says she was and then stops, instead of just saying she died, so something else must have happened to her. Now, she's the reason why the Rukashova mushrooms turn red, so this leads me to believe that she was probably sacrificed as a means to stop the curse, especially since Karya was the land of Chemia, a kind of alchemy that worked on life itself. As a consequence, her body may have turned into a catalyst that allowed Clothar to grow that strange Rukashava mushroom, and now that I think about it, he had his son eat it, but also attracted the elemental beings as a side effect. When it comes to Clothar being buried with his lover, this obviously means that someone else buried him, he certainly didn't bury himself. The only two people who could have learned about his lover's tomb are Caribert and Lumine, especially since for the Abyss Order he completely lost his mind and disappeared, so one of the two must have laid him to rest with the love of his life. Second, who was the real Caribert in our history? Charibet I was a Merovingian king of Paris from the 6th century and he was Clothar I and Ingun's son and was Saint Bertha's father. He was the only Merovingian king to be excommunicated since he had four concurrent wives, two of which were sisters. Now, isn't it strange that the writers chose the names of two French kings for a noble pureblood Carian and his half Carian and half Monstader's son instead of, I don't know, Germanic names? Is this a strange way to remind us that the next nation is Fontaine? Would I be reading too much into it if I said that it's also strange that Clothar's name is a little bit too similar to Clotho, one of the three Moirai sisters, the ancient Greek personification of fate, the one sister that spins the thread of human life from a spindle. 
And yes, it's a different tool compared to the loom since the spindle is used to make the actual fiber while the loom weaves the cloth, but then again, despite the actual mythology, in fantasy works we always hear about the loom of fate, not the spindle of fate. Lastly, I need to talk or update our understanding of Lumine's timeline post-Cataclysm, even though I have some doubts now. When Lumine woke up in Tevat after Sasti caught her, I think she first traveled alone to gather the powers of the Seven. I have two reasons to believe this. We just relieved her memories, but we could choose whether we consider some of the Archons our enemies or friends. As either, not Lumine, we are friends with the four Archons we've met so far, so why were we given that option? Did the Archons know Lumine? Did John Lee and Venti lie to us? The other reason is that Lumine helped the Aranara fix the Varuna contraption, gaining the name of Nara Varuna, but the Aranara never said anything about a companion, so Dainsleth wasn't traveling with her right after the Cataclysm. Anyway, she eventually traveled with Dainsleth and when they got to Sumeru, he left her to rest at that house and went into the Avidia forest, where Lumine had this encounter. Later, when Clothar founded the Abyss Order, Lumine split up with Dainsleth who didn't believe in finding a way to lift the curse, while Lumine witnessed the extent of the power of the Abyss, which is actually capable of lifting that kind of curse. That is why, when we met her in front of the Defiled Statue, she said that Dainsleth was her enemy. Honestly, if Lumine told Dainsleth about what she witnessed, maybe things would have gone completely different. And now it's time to talk about the voice inside the head, and about the Cryo Herald, actually. I think it's pretty obvious who, in general, he is. We literally read it when we fought the Fortune Lecture, but it was also made clear from what we heard. I mean, Fate has not granted you the right to enter this place, and I grant you the trial of destiny. I know your fate well. Rise beyond the fate bestowed upon you. It's as if fate was calling to me. And, you know, thanks to his power, Caribert is now... The Loom of Fate. Even the Abyss Lector Fathomless Flame says something similar. The fate of this world is already sealed. And not too long ago, we heard... The fate of Tevat cannot easily be changed. The same is true of fate. So, he is fate. Now, he is capable of lifting a curse that is a way of branding us at the level of the fate of the world itself. And he's capable of seeing either through a memory from 400 years ago in a dream in the present, probably because memories flow through the ley lines and they extend to the abyss. This also explains how somebody for reasons only they can know, is deliberately obfuscating her fate. When Lumine reached the end of her journey. Someone who has more power than the Avatar of Ermansoul, someone who is above the gods of Tevat. Like a shade, maybe? We already know about Estroth, and I think that both Paimon and Sasti are two other shades. That leaves us with just one single shade. And I've always said that he's most likely the word tree that powers the entire master domain to that. We can also safely say that the stars are the Ermansoul or Leyline fruits that hold information about the people and either determine, guide, or predict people's fate. And Leyline stretch from the sky to the abyss as well as Ermansoul, the one from Sumeru, lies in the underground cavern deep beneath the earth and grows upside down, so yes, I'm saying that he is Phanes. Because I believe that Phanes is not the primordial one and because he is the only shade that we know to be androgynous, so both male and female, while the others should be all women, so he, or according to Before Sun and Moon, it, is the only one who could probably have a male voice. Now, who is he talking to? I don't think he's talking to either, especially because he's not really there. Two options here. He's talking to Clothar, who is the one we see bowing down. He is seeking the power to restore Caribert's mind. From Tevat's point of view, he was born in sin since Kanria didn't follow the gods, but he's still pure and spotless, also because he wasn't part of the group that created the Cataclysm. He knows his fate well, he certainly has resentment, and he shouldn't accept the lies about the curse being impossible to lift, since, as we saw later, it can be lifted. 
Becoming the transcendent one could mean becoming the leader of the Abyss Order, rising beyond the fate, or curse in this case, bestowed upon him. The voice will shed a tear at the end of time, probably Ida's time, looking back at everything he achieved thanks to the power of the Abyss. This could make sense, right? The other option is Lumine. She may have bowed down to the Abyss. She was seeking power to, probably back then, find his brother again. We don't know how she was born in Sin, but I still have a theory that the Traveler twins are the Genshin Impact adaptation of Abel and Cain, Adam and Eve's son, who were born in Sin, yet pure and spotless, well up until Cain put an end to Abel out of jealousy, that is. The voice would know her fate well, and in the end, Lumin's fate was recorded inside Ermansol. She had probably been long enough in Tavad for Ermansol to predict her fate at that point. She resents Sasti for both her brother and for the people of Kanria. I have to be honest here, I don't know about the lies. If she uses the power of the Abyss, she can rise as the Transcendent One and forge a different fate for herself. At the end of time, probably at the end of Tevat itself, he will shed a tear looking back upon her life because if Tevat ends, he will probably too. Honestly, considering how Lumine became the Princess of the Abyss Order not too long after, I really think he was talking to her. One last thing about the voice. He is a sinner. We heard about sinners before in Ankanomiya, which incidentally has the same architecture and statues as the place where the voice was. My theory is still the same here. The shades are not gods. The primordial one is not a god as well. If the primordial one is actually Lilith and she was the first woman created who defied God's will and produced hordes of demons and in Genshin Impact the gods are called demon gods, then the shades are, indeed, sinners since they are most likely copies of the primordial one but with a mind of their own. And that's it! I hope you liked the video and I hope you couldn't hear my allergy in my voice. This video was supposed to be a short one but... Yeah, it's no surprise at this point. If you have questions, doubts or theories, feel free to use the comment section so that we can discuss together. As always, if you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and if you enjoy Genshin Impact theories, consider subscribing. My next video is supposed to be about Snezhnaya, but considering how Kolei, Tainari and Saino are coming to Mansa for the Windbloom Festival, I think we will get another huge chunk of lore, so there's a chance my next video will be about that. Anyway, thanks for watching and until next time, over and out.